Episode 33. Madame Pomfrey clapped a hand to her mouth. Professor McGonagall stared at Dumbledore. But Albus, surely, who? The question is not who, said Dumbledore, his eyes on Colin. The question is how? And from what Harry could see of Professor McGonagall's shadowy face, she didn't understand this any better than he did. Chapter 11. The Dueling Club. Harry woke on Sunday morning to find the dormitory blazing with winter sunlight and his arm reboned, but very stiff. He sat up quickly and looked over at Colin's bed, but it had been blocked from view by the high curtains Harry had changed behind yesterday. Seeing that he was awake, Madame Pomfrey came bustling over with a breakfast tray and then began bending and stretching his arm and fingers. All in order, she said, as he fed himself porridge with one hand. When you've finished eating, you may leave. Harry dressed as quickly as he could and hurried off to Gryffindor Tower, desperate to tell Ron and Hermione about Colin and Dobby. But they weren't there. Harry left to look for them, wondering where they could have got to, and feeling slightly hurt that they weren't interested in whether he had his bones back or not. As Harry passed the library, Percy Weasley strolled out of it, looking in far better spirits than the last time they'd met. Oh, hello, Harry, he said. Excellent flying yesterday, really excellent. Gryffindor has just taken the lead for the House Cup. You earned 50 points. You haven't seen Ron or Hermione, have you? said Harry. No, I haven't, said Percy, his smile fading. I hope Ron's not in another girl's toilet. Harry, forced to laugh, watched Percy walk out of sight and then headed straight for Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. He couldn't see why Ron and Hermione would be in there again, but after making sure neither Filch nor any prefects were around, he opened the door and heard their voices coming from a locked stall. It's me, he said, closing the door behind him. There was a clunk a splash, and a gasp from within the stall, and he saw Hermione's eye peering through the keyhole. Harry, she said, you gave us such a fright. Come in. How's your arm? Fine, said Harry, squeezing into the stall. An old cauldron was perched on the toilet, and crackling from under the rim told Harry they had lit a fire beneath it. Conjuring up portable, waterproof fires was a specialty of Hermione's. We'd have come to meet you, but we decided to get started on the polyjuice potion, Ron explained, as Harry, with difficulty, locked the stall again. We decided this is the safest place to hide it. Harry started to tell them about Colin, but Hermione interrupted. We already know. We heard Professor McGonagall telling Professor Flitwick this morning. That's why we decided we'd better get going. The sooner we get a confession out of Malfoy, the better, snarled Ron. Do you know what I think? He was in such a foul temper after the Quidditch match, he took it out on Colin. There's something else, said Harry, watching Hermione tearing bundles of knot grass and throwing them into the potion. Darby came to visit me in the middle of the night. Ron and Hermione looked up amazed. Harry told them everything Dobby had told him, or hadn't told him. Hermione and Ron listened with their mouths open. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened before, Hermione said. This settles it, said Ron in a triumphant voice. Lucius Malfoy must have opened the chamber when he was at school here, and now he's told dear old Draco how to do it. It's obvious. Wish Dobby told you what kind of monster's in there, though. I want to know how come nobody's noticed it sneaking around the school. Maybe it can make itself invisible, said Hermione, prodding leeches to the bottom of the cauldron. Or maybe it can disguise itself, pretend to be a suit of armor or something. I've read about chameleon ghouls. 
You read too much, Hermione, said Ron, pouring dead lace wings on top of the leeches. He crumpled up the empty lace wing bag and looked at Harry. So Dobby stopped us from getting on the train and broke your arm? He shook his head. You know what, Harry? If he doesn't stop trying to save your life, he's going to kill you. The news that Colin Creevy had been attacked and was now lying as though dead in the hospital wing had spread through the entire school by Monday morning. The air was suddenly thick with rumour and suspicion. The first years were now moving around the castle in tight-knit groups as though scared they would be attacked if they ventured forth alone. Ginny Weasley who sat next to Colin Creevy in charms, was distraught. But Harry felt that Fred and George were going the wrong way about cheering her up. They were taking turns, covering themselves with fur or boils and jumping out at her from behind statues. They only stopped when Percy, apoplectic with rage, told them he was going to write to Mrs. Weasley and tell her Ginny was having nightmares. Meanwhile, hidden from the teachers, a roaring trade in talismans, amulets, and other protective devices was sweeping the school. Neville Longbottom bought a large, evil-smelling green onion, a pointed purple crystal, and a rotting newt tail, before the other Gryffindor boys pointed out that he was in no danger. He was a pure blood and therefore unlikely to be attacked. They went for filch first, Neville said, his round face fearful, and everyone knows I'm almost a squib. In the second week of December, Professor McGonagall came around as usual, collecting names of those who would be staying at school for Christmas. Harry, Ron, and Hermione signed her list. They had heard that Malfoy was staying, which struck them as very suspicious. The holidays would be the perfect time to use the polyjuice potion and try to worm a confession out of him. Unfortunately, the potion was only half finished. They still needed the bicorn horn and the boom slang skin, and the only place they were going to get them was from Snape's private stores. Harry privately felt he'd rather face Slytherin's legendary monster than let Snape catch him robbing his office. What we need, said Hermione briskly as Thursday afternoon double potions lesson loomed nearer, what we need is a diversion. Then one of us can sneak into Snape's office and take what we need. Harry and Ron looked at her nervously. I think I'd better do the actual stealing, Hermione continued in a matter-of-fact tone. You two will be expelled if you get into any more trouble, and I've got a clean record. So all you need to do is cause enough mayhem to keep Snape busy for five minutes or so. Harry smiled feebly. Deliberately causing mayhem in Snape's potions class was about as safe as poking a sleeping dragon in the eye. Potions lessons took place in one of the large dungeons. Thursday afternoon's lesson proceeded in the usual way. Twenty cauldrons stood steaming between the wooden desks, on which stood brass scales and jars of ingredients. Snape prowled through the fumes, making waspish remarks about the Gryffindor's work, while the Slytherins sniggered appreciatively. Draco Malfoy, who was Snape's favorite student, kept flicking pufferfish eyes at Ron and Harry, who knew that if they retaliated, they would get detention faster than you could say unfair. Harry's swelling solution was far too runny, but he had his mind on more important things. He was waiting for Hermione's signal and he hardly listened as Snape paused to sneer at his watery potion. When Snape turned and walked off to bully Neville, Hermione caught Harry's eye and nodded. 
Harry ducked swiftly down behind his cauldron, pulled one of Fred's filibuster fireworks out of his pocket, and gave it a quick prod with his wand. The firework began to fizz and sputter. Knowing he had only seconds, Harry straightened up, took aim, and lobbed it into the air. It landed right on target in Goyle's cauldron. Goyle's potion exploded, showering the whole class. People shrieked as splashes of the swelling solution hit them. Malfoy got a face full and his nose began to swell like a balloon. Goyle blundered around, his hands over his eyes, which had expanded to the size of a dinner plate. Snape was trying to restore calm and find out what had happened. Through the confusion, Harry saw Hermione slip quietly into Snape's office.